I would just say don't underestimate your learner. We perhaps look through a lens of the world that actually somebody's a novice at something, therefore they can't do something. But I think certainly what I've picked up from the day is, even though it might be a brand new experience for you, if I pose you the right problem and support you in the right way, then potentially the sky's your limit, as they say. Welcome to the Liverpool FA podcast. Our aim is to provide regular insight from a variety of experts to help you in your own football journey. We'll do it through interviews, roundtable discussions and by linking to other resources to help support you. For more information about each episode, just tap the album art, which will provide you with more about our guests and links to further content. Welcome back. This episode is the last of the pilot series that we recorded in the summer of 17. However, we've been busy recording over the winter and we've got some great guests and conversations coming out in the next few weeks. We'd love to hear your feedback from this first collection, what you've liked, disliked, found helpful or want more or less of, and even guest suggestions. So please tweet us at Liverpool underscore CFA or get me direct at Jack Walton one For this one, I collared Andy Summers, Loz Locke, and Mark Haining from the grassroots unit at the FA to unpick a day we had down in Worcester learning how to row from scratch, which was part of a course we were on. The four of us were complete novices, and so we thought we would share what we made of the leadership styles and coach behaviours we experienced and try to draw any parallels to coaching football. So this one might be relevant to you if you're interested in how your behaviours may impact the players you coach. This one was a bit of a risk, as we're aware that we were describing an event that nobody listening in had witnessed, so hopefully it comes across logically. We look forward to what you have to say anyway. A few updates before we start. Liverpool's coach education programme for 2018 is live on the new website at liverpoolfa.com. The last free CPD event we ran was around coaching through the winter. Thanks to all those who came along and to Mark Horlick for bringing his under-11s in, and the winter weather definitely didn't disappoint. The next event we have will be looking at effective planning and you can book onto this via the website. The new website also has a coaching opportunities page where clubs can advertise vacancies they have. So it's worth checking out if you're looking to get involved or if you're a club that needs some extra help. For those interested in futsal, the FA Futsal Conference is at St George's Park next weekend. That's the 17th of February and you can book onto that online. And speaking of futsal, we've got Ian Bateman, who's involved with two of the national teams, coming on very soon. That's all the updates for now, so enjoy this one with Andy, Lars and Mark. Mark Haining, Andy Summers, Lawrence Locke, thanks for joining us. We've had a a long, hot day here at St George's Park. It is almost midsummer, and I've uh, I've collared you three guys to come together to share our experiences of a day that we had down in Worcester last week on the river with a uh, quite a competitive rowing exercise that we took part in. Um, Mark, and you're going to set the scene for us in a moment. And the aim of this podcast, which is going to be slightly different to our other episodes, is we're going to try to pick apart the day that we had with a view of the coaching behaviours that we experienced. We've jotted down a few questions that we want to try and answer in relation to coach behaviours and how they might apply for us and for coaches out there in their own context in a football environment. Before we get onto that, um, I'm going to try and let these guys introduce themselves. So Mark, if you can start with you, give us your your title and what, what a typical week looks like for you. Yeah, um, I'm the county coach developer for uh, Oxfordshire FA and the RFFA. Typical week, I suppose, really is um, dealing with coach development and um, coach delivery um, in, in both of those counties. For the RAF, it tends to be during the week and for Oxfordshire FA, it tends to be predominantly weekend. Uh, Andy Summers, so I'm the uh, senior regional coach mentor, uh, so average week would look like managing a support in a team of regional officers that operate across the country, who then support a team of 300 mentors, uh, as well as that coordinate the West Midlands as a region, which has 28 mentors in as well. Uh, Lawrence Locke um, from the FAP unit, uh, typical week, I develop coaches from 
the community departments from professional clubs and supporting teachers um, through the Primary Teachers Award. Thanks, guys. So, Mark, you were the sensible one who decided to stay dry on the side and watch us and amuse yourself at our, our rowing expertise or lack of. Uh, if you could kind of set the scene for the listeners of the day and the context and how it's all come about. Yeah, so um, so we're part of a, a group that's studying the postgraduate certificate for sports coaching with Worcester University. And we've been looking at a, a various different um, modules. Um, th- this particular module was around uh, leadership. So our tutors um, thought it'd be a, what a great idea to take a, uh, a group of FA staff, put them in a boat and um, shove them out on a river. So really, it was a it was a day for us all to go down to Worcester Uni. Um, we worked with a couple of female rowing coaches who were basically briefed to assist but not take the lead. So um, really, I suppose the scene was that it was two groups of people, two two different boats, um, actually get us in the boats on the river, and then ultimately put us into a, a context of a race um, with a few other little challenges in between. Yeah, so Andy, I don't know uh, if you noticed, but I think we were, we were being watched from minute one and the the coaching started before we even got the boat into the water, would you agree? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There was um, there was obviously a couple of coaches who headed it up as well as I think there was four additional uh, members of well, rowing experts, I would say, or participants who row for the university. So right from the sort of initial initial meet, there was there was some coaching going on. Probably with the first task of trying to trying to lift a, I think it was a was it a hundred kilo boat that we had. So trying to actually lift that was a was a challenge in itself to start. Yeah, I think um, having the rowing team there with us, it kind of allowed us to trust them in terms of we kind of saw what they did and we kind of copied the way they lifted the boats off, the way they carried things, and we kind of listened to what they said. As, as novices, it was what's, what's the word I'm looking for quite safe for us because they were heavy. We're like, how are we going to collect these? And they kind of set the scene for us to help us out. Yeah, I had no idea how heavy one of those boats was. So as soon as this, that, the weight started bearing down, I thought, I do not want to be asked a question, guided. I just want to be told that I'm safe. Uh, and I want, to, I want somebody to model the behaviours that I can copy here. Because straight away, I, I felt quite vulnerable in that, in that situation. Uh, I had no idea one of those boats was so heavy. <laughs> I, I think the interesting thing was watching it was the fact they, they got you to bring the boats to a certain place and put them down and then talked you through a few bits and then almost got you to do it again, pick them up and then take them to another place, but actually down a different sort of route. So the change in how people manoeuvred the boats from the first pick-up point to the first drop-off and then picked them up from that second drop or that drop-off point to the second place, there was a visible change in the sense that people could... Um, they knew what was coming, whereas initially they didn't. So it's quite an awkward pickup initially, but actually a, a far more um, fluid pickup the second time. Yeah, and I'm not sure whether whether it was intentional or not. But when we shifted the boats the second time, the the first boat we shifted, which it, I didn't end up in, we had all of us on it. So there was 15 on it that got to the water, and only half of us came back then to pick the second one up. So intentional or not, it I don't know. It felt a little bit different. But then there was a. I think the, the 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 second lift there was a real sort of focus on asking questions of the the guys of actually there's only half of us now how like what's the best way of lifting this what's the best technical way of getting all of us down and surprisingly it felt a little bit easier and a little bit smoother having having less of us um, but also we probably felt a bit more comfortable in a smaller group asking them questions of them of how we're going to do it and how we're going to get it from A to B. Yeah, so I think if we were to sum up the sort of coach behaviours that we we experienced in those first 10 minutes, just a group of novices turning up to an environment that I, I don't think any of us have had, ever been in before, would that be right? How would we summarise those coach behaviours for those first 10 minutes of literally just getting the boat from the platform into the water? Uh, I think it was very, you tell us, we'll listen. For me, I didn't want to get injured. I didn't want people to get injured. So it was very, you're the experts and we're novices, so you've got to tell us what to do. And I think once, if we go back to the end where we did it again, we kind of understood what was happening. We'd we'd been through the mechanism, so it gave us a bit more confidence after. Yeah, from from a participant point of view, I think it was, we wanted telling. 
it'd be interesting to to speak to the coaches because actually looking back and reflecting, I'm not sure actually how much they told us. I think they actually just left us and we sort of figured it out, although it was a bit of a challenge. And then individually people asked questions as they were going, but actually we wanted telling, but a lot of the time they just left us to, to pick it up ourselves. I think there was a definite trust shift, definite trust shift that I saw in terms of, even though I agree what Andy said there, even though the coaches weren't actually telling you a lot, what happened is over that, that two hours, if you like, from picking that first boat up to actually then taking the boat back out the water, it was almost like the coaches weren't even there at the end because there'd been a definite trust shift. Without yeah. Sure yeah, we'll pick up that, that story in a moment of how that developed and, and how important that is. One of the things that I noticed in those early stages was even just the lack of feedback. So again, taking those heavy boats down into the water, it was literally do this and then, and then no feedback. And I, I actually, oh, I didn't know if I was doing the right thing or not, but I, I felt... They had my trust from those first 10 minutes and I thought, these guys know what they're doing. They're going to look after us here. I'm, I'm okay. How important is that for coaches now in a, in a football context? I, I think that's very important right, right from the off. And I suppose it's, it's making sure that um, as a learner, you feel safe. And I think that that's quite important for us as coaches to, to recognise that, that we, we, I suppose the more experienced you are with something, the more you take it for granted, that knowledge and that transfer of knowledge. And there's almost an assumption that the learner is in a certain place. So I think building that rapport really, really quick and recognising where the learner's at and actually operating from their level is, is huge. Especially from, from a novice performer point of view. So I think that may, may shift a little bit if you became more... I don't know, more better at the better of that sport, but I think especially with a novice, that trust is is huge. And I know my sort of links with Vicky during that first ten minutes, there was there was quite a lot of jovial bits between us, rather than it being do this, do that. But actually, I think she tuned into me quite quickly. That that was the way I sort of probably got a bit of trust from her in terms of them conversations. Um, whereas others obviously was a little bit different. Mark, you can be our narrator here, uh, just to set the scene. Vicky was our coach, right? Mark, pick it up. So we've now got the boats in the water. Describe to the listeners what the next steps were that we undertook as both boats. Well, there was, there was a couple of tasks, and I think it was more of a, again, a trust task. So there was um, uh, a task where you were asked to try and stand up in the boat or uh, individuals that were, were standing up in the boat. And again, I think that um, th there was almost a um, definitely out of comfort zone going on and almost even though it was colleagues in the boat so there was an element of you know if we were on dry land we'd, we'd probably trust each other implicitly but I think now that the um, the game had moved a little bit in the sense that we're now on the water even though you're with your colleagues it was more about it definitely looked from the outside looking in as self-preservation um, and that was apparent on a lot of people's body language and face there was a task then where you had to manipulate the boat as a, as a group to try and pick up some uh, tennis balls that had been thrown in the water. And then there was another task in terms of actually rocking the boat. I can't remember technically what it was called, but essentially it was literally forcing the boat from one side to the other. And again, just the body language in terms of the rocking the boat was interesting because people looked... Uh, there, there was, I think fear is probably too strong, but there was a definite angst amongst certain people you've just reminded me actually that yeah that it got serious at one point when we were being asked to to stand up in the boat one of our colleagues not naming names certainly set the tone that actually this wasn't a laughing matter anymore what what was some of the coach behaviors that that you saw from the sideline and, and Lawrence Sandy what did you experience from from in the boat for the, the coaches that were working with it, with us, I think initially there was there was perhaps quite a bit of amusement on their part. Not, and I don't mean in laughing at us. I think more sort of laughing with us. But again, I suppose looking at looking at that behaviour, I, I was sort of watching them at that point because I thought, yeah, it's almost like that um, that experience and that assumption that people can do things. I think that for me that was coming to the fore, and it's like I referenced earlier on. So it's almost like they were probably a little bit in shock themselves that actually, as a group, you were struggling with it. I think that's that's the sort of impression I got. Yeah. Um, I thought they remained calm when they did set the challenge. It was a rocky boat, you know, 
but as coaches I thought they didn't go into any pressure they just remained calm said this is your task didn't kind of tell us how to do it just kind of gave us a thing around you can't stand in that area but you can stand in this area and it kind of reassured me when they said oh you can do it and I think Jack you standing in front of me reassured me as well because he kind of said just just have a go at it and I did it and then the next person as it triggered up up, up the boat it kind of thought right, we've, we've set up this mechanism so you know the coaches remained calm and that the environment they created in that on that boat was was calming for me. Yeah, I think the, I think the rocking of the I can't remember what, again what it was called, but the rocking of the boat sort of gave us more trust in them because it sort of took us to like a not a worst case scenario, but it took us to a actually you're going to have to do something really dramatic to make it tip, which then probably allowed people to focus a bit more and actually not just sitting in the boat and understanding that I can sit in it to actually then rowing and actually get into some of the detail that actually came above it. And from, from our boat, when we first got in, there was a real, and some of us, not all, there was a real frustration. And there was comments from behind me of just tell me what to do. Really, please just tell me how do I do this with, with sort of nothing coming back. And it was interesting and like individuals within the boat started to take leads of, I think this is what we should do and this is how we should move it forward. But that first probably, I don't know, first two minutes from the moment that we sort of just got pushed into the water in terms of the boat just got moved across into the middle of the into the middle of the river, there was a there was a definite frustration from us as performers of I'm now on the water and I still haven't got a clue what I'm doing or I haven't been given anything around this is how you move the boat that way and this is what's expected of you. I, th- I think there's an interesting dynamic between the difference between the coaches that are on the side and the experts that are in the back of the boats. So each of the boats, just for the <clears> listeners, <throat> each of our boats had two of the university rowing team in who were, I suppose, there for health and safety reasons as much as anything else. Mm. And, and they, I think, again, you know, watching the coaches on the side and watching those experts in the boat... There was a diff. There was a complete difference, and I think there was a. It was really hard for the guys in the boat if they'd been briefed not to help, not to help. If that makes sense, in the sense that the nervousness of the of the novices was actually transferring to those two experts as well initially, and I think certainly when the, you were rocking the boats, where that built up to a little bit of a crescendo at, at, at a point, the guys in the back of the boat weren't really doing a lot of the rocking because I think they were. They were, they were perhaps not too sure themselves how far you were going to prepare to rock it, I think. So as far as that task, which was our first task of stand up in the boat. So there were two experts plus five. Is that right? But seven, seven of us in the boat, weren't there? As far as that task goes, it was interesting that the coaches set the problem, told us what success would be, told us the parameters and the rules of what we couldn't do, and said, go and have a go. So they never actually told us, you must do it this way. And but at this point, it's still quite alien to us. We're still, there's still a few nerves out there. What do you guys make of that, of that coach behavior that we experienced? And why do you think they did it like that? Yeah, I thought that, that was key because, you know, going back to them setting us tasks, they kind of gave us a freedom to have a go at it. We, we might have made mistakes along the way, but then they reined us back in when they needed to. And I thought that was key because we, we did some things that were wrong and then they kind of reset us and then let us have another go. Then they reset us again. So in, in terms of that learning cycle, we you know we made the mistakes and we, we learned from those mistakes. And then by the end, we, we were getting some success. Yeah, I think the sharing of that within the boats was key as well. So I know uh, within within our boat, which was separate to, to yours, Lawrence, there was... Um, from the first person who stood up, there was then a relay of information of don't put your feet there. Actually, if you shift them to the side, you can push against the outside of the boat. So there was a, there was then sort of a, an internal sort of coaching going on. Even though, again, we were still really, really novice at it, there was a sharing of experience quite quickly. I felt sorry for the first person who had to stand up because that had to start it off. Um, however, there was then a quick sort of realisation and as a team and as a group of eight, which there was, or seven on the boat, there was a, an upskilling of people individually really quickly without it being coach, coach driven. It was driven from us. And actually, they didn't give us anything to model it on and go, actually, this is how you should do it. It was just actually the, the aim of the thing was to stand up. So however you did it, that was that was successful and it was seen as success. And then 
the feedback from Vicky or the coaches on the side was, was really positive when she saw it happen of brilliant, great, sit back down again, sort of that's fine, like well done. There wasn't anything, there wasn't, there was definite feedback from her, which then sort of reassured you that actually, yeah, I can, I can do that. I think that whole process of that and those things we've been studying around that transformational leadership, for instance, and that, that autonomy supportive stance was definitely evident in, in the fact that they did just give you, here you are, it is the thing, gave you a, a very basic outline of what the, what the, the uh, problem was and things you might do to solve it. So that bit around that guided discovery and that sort of solving a problem as a, as a team of, of performers, if you like, was very, very evident and linked back to the theory around it. There was clear evidence in terms of that transformational part and that, that definitely that, that autonomy, supportive sort of leadership stance. And the coaches, was, although they were on the side, they, was, they were still there. So I know a couple of people in our boat actually shouted questions across. So it was quite individual. But the rest of us in the boat heard the answer, if that makes sense. So although we were, quite, we were left, there was still that support there, but it was driven by us. As participants, so again, there was there's people in the boat who probably didn't want to ask, but then someone else in the boat would would shout up and go, yeah, actually, I need some. What can you just clarify what the task is, or can you give us a tiny bit of guidance to help us? We're stuck at this point. We need to literally, we need to get just past this so we can can move it on. So that sounding board was still there, just probably in a bit more of a distant role than being someone with you constantly in the boat. Kind of links to that. Um, even though we we were a team on each boat. Within the boat, there were little subgroups being created. So I know Jack and I were like kind of facing each other. So we had a group. And then I know that Chris and I think Keith was behind. They were talking to each other and giving each other feedback as they went along. And I think that, that was key in terms of, yeah, that's our outcome. But then as a coach, you can't see everything. So it was key for the players to give each other feedback, you know, to improve in those little small margins, which got us better as we went along. Yeah, and there's a reason why I was facing you at the start, Lawrence, isn't there? Yeah, I don't know if any of you noticed the uh, my shift in mood when I was voted in as the Cox. So I'd got my hopes up to uh, to have a nice bit of physical activity on the river and I had a flashback to my childhood being last picked in the playground or being left on the bench for my school team and not getting a game. Yeah, so uh, that actually put me in a different frame of mind that I was... I felt relegated to the position of Cox, which I knew was in terms of rowing, a position of leadership, but also made me feel lost, completely hopeless because I was now expected to almost coach from within the boat, but I had no idea the information or the help that that my team needed me to give. Anything in the last part of the discussion that we can learn as coaches in, in a football context from that, Mark? I, I, th- I think just to reinforce that point, though, was uh, obviously I thought I was just going to have a quite, quite a good morning just watching you all do stuff. And at the point that you'd got to a place where you were quite safe and happy in the boats, then they threw in the competition. But it was literally as she walked past me, she said, oh, can you coach one of the teams? And then she walked off. And I'm thinking, coach what? Because it's like, well, okay, I can give you some generic things, but actually what's the the technical detail of rowing, I perhaps hadn't really watched the detail of what you were trying to to do and now all of a sudden now coach it. And I suppose it's that bit, right, okay, well, I'm not an expert here, so I don't know what this is going to be like. So I had to default to perhaps just coming up with some approaches that I thought might work without any technical input. Yeah, and I suppose this might lend itself to when we talk to coaches about giving ownership and empowerment to the players in their care, to what extent, for what reason and what parameters does the coach set? Or do we just literally sometimes say lead and wonder why the players sometimes get a little bit lost with that if they've never experienced that level of ownership and, and empowerment before? I would say that that's a, probably a real good learning point from the day. And, and equally, the, you know, if, you, if you reflect on, you know, if I go back to my youth when we played, we, we were allowed to do that informal stuff. There wasn't coaches around telling us how to play the game. You just, you just learnt it playing through with your friends and your brothers and sisters and things like that. And games would last for hours. There was no adult involvement in that. And maybe more, now kids are in more formally controlled settings that actually, yeah, just throwing that ownership at them without any guidance can actually 
have a negative effect in certain circumstances. Yeah, I think link, linking to that in terms of the, the separate tasks that we had, something that sort of for me as a coach, from the initial task around getting the tennis ball, the rocking of the boat, the standing up was quite individual in terms of you were identified within there. And also I had to then switch boats as well halfway through. So I felt a little bit insecure at that time because it was aimed predominantly at me. When we raced and there were seven of us, I felt really comfortable because I felt like I could mask some of the, some of the stuff I wasn't great at as part of the team and, or as part of the, the wider game rather than it being just based on me as an individual and my technical ability. It became more of a, a wider participant of the group. So you, you sort of took your role within that group, which for me as a coach was really interesting in terms of when I'm, when I'm working with a group of players, actually how do I structure my sessions and actually what roles do we give players and if we get new players join the group what what do we do with them and how, how does that fit um so being that participant probably has opened my eyes in terms of some of the stuff i do as a coach and some of my behaviors so mark just take us back and rewind and talk us through those those couple of tasks so andy mentioned about the tennis ball talk us through that and we'll perhaps discuss what happened with that the swapping boats that he mentioned and then um, we'll look at what sort of coaching behaviours we witnessed and why and how that made us feel and then we'll get on to the, the main part which was obviously the race. Well, well I think going, going for the boat swap first it, it was interesting that uh, again I was asked to coach it so it then really made me hone in right technically what, what do they need to do and I was thinking right there's going to have to be some sort of balancing in here so I suppose slightly naughty of me but I th thought right okay what I'll start doing is asking people on the side and maybe the experts in the boat but I was posing some questions to them that almost steered them to giving me the answer so I was probably putting my coaching head on to try and get some information that I could then transfer back to you as coaches so I, what I said to one of the guys in the back of one of the boats I said if they put their paddles flat in the water and push down on it is that going to help them balance when they get close he went yeah that'd be a good idea so then I was trying to tell you that as you were trying to get the boats close together. So if the opposite person put the paddle in the water and put some pressure down on it, that should allow a smoother transfer. Um, so it sort of worked, but I think it more worked because actually the two the two teams in the two boats recognised this is going to be quite serious if somebody falls in the water. So um, I felt from as a team perspective, they both got the boats really close really quick. So the idea was two crews, we had to out on the water, joined the boats together yeah. and we had to swap Chris Morris, who's one of our colleagues for Andy and, and have them almost walk the plank, if you like, to do that. Why did you go with a question and approach and what made you select the types of question that you did, Mark? Perhaps because of what we've discussed, I recognise that actually that, that what we're not going to get is any solutions to the problems. So I just felt, right, OK, if I go down the line of, of, of asking the right, a question in a way that... I'm going to lead you to a place where you can you can confirm or deny a bit of it, a, a question I'm going to give you. And I was just trying to apply a little bit of logic based on the fact that, right, okay, if you put a counterbalance into the water, but because it was a safety thing and I wasn't actually in the boats, I wanted to try and make sure that I was getting information that was going to help you as opposed to me just going, yeah, I think if you do that. So it was almost a confirmation, I suppose, I wanted. And I suppose by asking a question and proposing a solution them giving me a confirmation of it was simpler or was more palatable than them just giving me the solution to the problem. Yeah, just being one of the ones who was asked to shift as well, we were told, we weren't asked as the boat, choose who's going to switch boat. So as a, as a participant, my reaction was, oh, why me? Why have I been chosen to do that? But then 20 seconds later was the thought of, they must have seen something that I've done that's been okay in terms of either standing up or whatever it was. So there was a bit of a... Um, so in terms of the coach having an impact on me as a participant was quite big in terms of probably confidence in terms of going actually I've been chosen to do it but it wasn't a, a discussion within the boat so whether that was for a health and safety reason of actually them two could stand up or whatever it as a participant it had quite a big impact on me in fairness from the side the two shooters said the two were students so we swapped them over <laughs> no, we didn't. I knew that was coming I knew that was coming <laughs> yeah. so Mark we've now managed to acquire Andy for our crew Talk us through the tennis ball task and what were some of the coach behaviours that you you witnessed there? I think it links in with what Lawrence was talking about earlier on in the sense that um, there were certain people were 
I wouldn't say they were developing a mastery of it, of the, the technique of rowing, but they were definitely getting better at it and listening to the advice they were, that was going on around them. So they were almost went into their individual world. So there was people pulling in the water and people pushing in the water at the same time. So actually, there was a period of time where one boat didn't go anywhere because people were actually counteracting each other. But I think uh, one, of the, one of the groups recognised that the flow of the water was actually, if we got in the right place, the water was going to bring the ball to us, as opposed to us trying to manipulate to, um, to the ball. So it was interesting from a perspective of different people being at different levels of expertise, for want of a better phrase, in terms of that short time that they were learning how to row. So I think it kind of linked to what the aim goal was, to be able to manoeuvre the boat. So just to be clear, so set the scene, our coach Vicky from the side was throwing a tennis ball out into the river some distance away. And as a crew, we had to then go and manoeuvre the boat into a position where I had my one shining moment of the day as a cox picking the tennis ball out of the water. Yeah, so um, that was a key part of the session. Part of the race was to to move the boat and be able to manoeuvre it. And the context was clear, so... You know, kind of the the carrot in the game was to go and collect the the tennis ball. But in terms of the technical stuff we were doing to be able to do that, we were getting so many technical outcomes. We'll be able to move the boat. We were able to work as a team and work together through different forms of relationships within that. And if you know, I've just thought back on it now. It was such a key moment in that thing. All we were doing was collecting the tennis ball, but the technical outcomes were so high, and we probably weren't thinking about that. It was just that's our game to collect that tennis ball and we had to beat the other team yeah I think in that in that element as well there was some real clarity around language um, in terms of terminology so Mark was saying about <laughs> I think it might have been our boat that we, we, we were just counteracting each other some of the terms that we were getting asked to understand we didn't have a clue what they meant so I think the relationship the coaches had built with us sort of 20-25 minutes and half an hour in then allowed us to go actually what does that mean so we then pose the question back of, can you give us that? Can you give us a, a language that actually we understand in terms of actually instead of that, can it just be push and pull? And I know in our boat they said actually when we're doing that, it's just bench pressing. So just and it, it stuck with people. So the the change of the terminology helped us become technically better at what we were doing. So in some ways it was it was hidden in terms of the technical detail was hidden in terms of, in in different language that was used, which I think from that it just really started to help us get a grasp of where we were getting. So it. it probably sped up the process a little bit in terms of us starting to understand it. I think when the, um, the experts in the boat came up with a, um, they came up with a really interesting phrase that I think people grasped straight away and it, it was chest waist away or words to that effect. And I think <clears throat> as a group once, once um, people got that and there was almost a bit of a mantra going for a little while around that, that those, those three things. I think, again, the, the, you could see like a visible confidence lift and people going, oh, right, yeah, OK, if we do that and then that and then that, then, then the boat will move. But I suppose what, what the thing that stood out for me as well was that the, if we're talking about mixed ability groups that we coach, there was almost a microcosm of that mixed ability in the boat over the space of those two hours. People became good at it in terms of being a, a grassroots um, novice, if you like, and people would probably... They got slightly better, but perhaps not on the scale that other people improved. So I think there was a, you know, if we looked at mixed ability groups over a, that we might have in a, a group of players, I think it was really, really stood out for me in terms of that um, that short space of time. Yeah, that's interesting that, that you say that, Mark. Just just backtracking a little bit when when we were racing to to go and fetch the, a, a tennis ball. It sounds mad just even saying it now. <laughs> when we were racing to go and fetch a tennis ball out of the river. The coaches set the problem and stood off and, and observed and then fed back. What was really interesting watching you guys from the front of the boat was, like you said, Andy, that technical language, almost jargon that our in-boat experts started to use with us caused mayhem. And like you said, Mark, there were we were going round in circles because one person's push was another person's pull, but they were using a language that none of us could understand. And I see that sometimes prevalent in coaches. We can be sometimes guilty of that working with players when we'll we'll use language or jargon that technically the the players might not understand. So I suppose 
an important message for us as coaches is being really clear on this is what I mean, this is this is what I say, or this is what I mean when I say X. And also having that rapport with the players where they feel comfortable enough to say, what do you mean by that? Rather than just nodding head and, and, and carrying on. I think, I think that's key when, you know, linking it back to football. I, I watched a, a game once and there was two coaches, one young coach, 18, 19, and the relationship he had with his kids, he wanted his kids to go and defend quickly. And all he said is, if you're nearest to the ball, try and win it back. The other coach, you know, highly experienced coach, but he was, in terms of his technical information, was go and press, go and go and press the ball quickly, go and um, screen, you know, in terms of that technical content. And these kids just kind of looked at him and was, you know, we're eight years old, we don't understand what screen and press means. Whereas the other coach was go, just going to try and win it back. Yeah, and that use of analogy, I think, is really important, Mark. Like you said, the uh, chest hips away. Or I remember working with a coach years ago and she had a fantastic analogy to teach the, the young players how to get into a good defensive position. And she would get them to uh, imagine they were standing on a surfboard. So rather than kind of crouching, touch tight, those sort of things, she would she would just remind the players by using the analogy of a surfboard. And it was apparent when we were in the boat that that analogy worked instantaneously with us and we just picked it up and, and or, or you guys were doing the rowing picked it up and, and that seemed to push us along quite quickly, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think that that was a very clear sort of um, confidence moment because once everyone, it was almost like um, you see sometimes when you're explaining things to people, you can almost see a visible penny drop, and it was definitely a penny drop moment um, for just I'd say everybody in the boat. Really, it was just then that coordination of what of who was doing what or when. So, did you all start at chest? Did you all when you, when you went from chest to, to hips? Um, at different rates that people did it at, I think was the bit that then just needed a little bit of work. Yeah, in in our back there was a real inch. Whether it was intentional or not, it doesn't really matter, but we only asked that question when we were close enough to the coach. I don't know whether that was because we felt safe. When we were out in the water in the middle, we didn't really ask the questions of the two experts on the back. We tried to figure it out, whether that was because people didn't feel comfortable asking the experts or whether from the first bit when they didn't get answers in that initial frustration, they didn't ask. But the wind sort of drifted us back towards the jetty. And when we got closer, I don't know whether it was, again, intentional or not, all of a sudden, when we got in the proximity of the coaches, th- there seemed to be a more of an openness to actually ask and challenge that question of, of where we were actually, what does that mean? How do we do this? Um, and that came from that safety of having the coach coach near us, I think, helped. Yeah, I think when we went off, we had a couple of minutes off on the banking. And at that time, the coaches kind of, we kind of went to the coach, the coaches came to us and they all gave us a little bit of information to make us better. And I think, you know, we weren't on the river. We, we were on dry land, which was which was safe, and we had that trust around them where we could just go and ask them some questions. And I remember asking one of the coaches, you know, I was quite confused what was push and what was pull, but he kind of like demonstrated it to me, and I was like, oh, actually, I understand it now. So it was just kind of that little intervention with me for thirty seconds. It, it helped me a lot when we went back into the river. That's interesting that you bring up the demonstrations, Lawrence. It's probably the first opportunity we've got to compare and contrast the sport in which we work in, football, to a sport that we've no experience with, rowing. What, are the, what, what do you guys see as some of the trade-offs in demonstrating in a football context? I suppose that, the, the, again, with younger players, maybe lesser able players, the danger almost is is, is that if you can... If you can demonstrate, but you can't bring it down to their level, is that it makes it almost an unobtainable thing for them. And although it wasn't actually a demonstration as such, that and I'll keep coming back to it, but I think it was just a, one of those sort of pivotal moments that chest hips away really sort of opened the world up. I think for people, so you could almost argue that there was a um, there was a demonstration going on of it, but it was actually behind people. Um, I know there were some people out of the boat at that time, so some people got to see it. But because it was made simple, I think that that really helped everybody. And uh, controversial, I, I struggled a little bit with that. With my big physique, I could I felt a little bit uncomfortable trying to trying to replicate what they'd done. So it links to what you've just. The gentleman who showed us was six foot four and and had a toned body and physique and. 
I, I felt a little bit uncomfortable and I sort of went into my own little bubble of I've got to find a way of doing that myself. And it wasn't probably till a, so 10 minutes later, I think Jack said, just cop, just go off Loz, just copy sort of off Loz what he's doing. So then Loz had come up with his own way of doing it. And then I sort of followed off the back of that. I felt a li- weirdly felt a little bit uncomfortable when he said, do this, because he did it. And I was like, wow, like, I, I don't think I can do that. I, I'll have to figure something out. So it was quite an interesting sort of, probably five minutes after that point where no other people in the boat went, brilliant, got it. I can I can crack on with that now. I'm I'm flying with that. And yeah, it sort of backs up your point. It put me in quite, I felt a bit bit awkward. I was like, oh, and I, I didn't want to challenge it because other people in the boat said, yeah, that perfect, got it. So I sort of sat and just probably kept my head down for a couple of minutes and tried to figure it out. It was, yeah. I, I think one of the, one of the real, there's lots of interesting things. One of the real interesting things was actually that, that and the confidence levels building and building. And even though it was before the race, people had got to a place where now they were actually focusing in on that technique and trying to work up their strategies and things. And there was other traffic on the river. And I think it was, it was quite, again, an interesting dynamic because the coaches and the experts in the boat were actually getting quite, they seemed more angsty about it than actually the novices who'd now started mastering this rowing, in inverting commas. So... Although they were making you aware that there was there was other traffic in the water and to try and you know you needed to steer away from it or move away from it, I didn't feel that the people either novices in the boat looked. They were more focused on actually moving the boat as opposed to the the experts seemed to be. Uh, we really need to get out of the way. So that was a quite an interesting dynamic to watch within the boat. I would absolutely agree. I had people say there's there's boats coming, and I can honestly say not once did I probably think I need to get out of the way of that. I was solely focused on me technically trying to trying to move the boat and linking that to, to coaching when then we probably ask kids to do more, three or four more things. And actually it's probably made me sort of think actually, yeah, I was I was completely zoned into that technical bit. And when other things were getting said, it was going in one ear and out the other. And I, I actually couldn't tell you anything about the boats that went past. I know a couple went past, two went one way and one went the other. That's about it. That's all I can that's all I can probably tell you. But the technical bit, I'd, I'd melt sort of 100% concentration on that. The bits that went on around, I, yeah, I couldn't really tell you. I think that goes back to the planning of the session. We were so on task and then, you know, again, linking back to football, we talk about behaviour management, kids getting bored and, you know, not liking football. But, you know, we've never rode before and in that two hours we were so on task because of the, the activities we were set were so engaging for us as a, as a group. And it goes back to the planning. The planning must have been, you know, what can we do to engage these football coaches? And I think that was key. And we didn't see the the things on the outside. We were so engaged in what we needed to do to get success. I think that was key. So for for kids playing football, how do we engage them in, in the right way in terms of the activities we set them? Yeah, probably probably links a bit more in terms of context around the sport as well, in terms of it being quite a... It was, although there was a team of seven, it was quite an individually sort of, yeah, it became, it, be, it felt quite individual when you're in there. And from the very start point, you felt safe. So although there was other boats on there, yeah, and we and weirdly we were in control, you never felt like anything was ever going to happen. Um, although you heard the shouts, it, yeah, it, you never felt in any danger whatsoever. It was quite interesting at one point because a, a barge came at one point. And I think... Um, the ability of the two of our two boats in the water to move wasn't quite matching the uh, the pace of a barge, believe it or not. Um, so the coach was was jogging down the towpath to actually ask the barge if they would deviate from I their didn't route. Notice this. So it was, um, but again, you were you were all focused in on tasks. So you were trying to move, but actually, I suppose if the if the if the barge had stayed on its on its course, then potentially there would have been a collision. Pick us up from here, Mark. So we've recap and we've uh, we've got the boats in the water somehow safely uh, we've done we've gone through some practices we've started to gain some or the rowers have certainly started to gain some more confidence in the boat I'm still sat at the front sulking so talk us through the, the race how that was framed and, and what you saw from from the side again it was uh, it, the uh, the coach actually said to me right okay um, coach your, you know you can coach your whichever boat you want to you want to you, you pick and coach the race. So again, I picked a little bit up, but I thought, well, we'll have a little bit of fun with it. And I think um, we, we managed to get some uh, the tennis balls in, in into the cocks just to uh, just to sway the argument. Should we need it? 
shall we say? But the, the, I think the interesting thing was that because she the, she set the race up, and there was a start point, and obviously an end point. And originally, it was just going to be from the steps to the bridge was going to be the winner. But I think somehow in the conversation, somewhere it got thrown in, you were going to do a turn, which I must admit at the time I was thinking, mm, I'm not sure that's a wise move. I don't know how long that turn will take. But looking from the side into the boats, as soon as you, they got you lined up, it was almost like these people want to win the game. The competitive thing came right to the fore. And again, just reading body language, you could see that people were in that boat. To The majority, not all, but the majority were that right, we're going to win this. And their, their body language said that as well. Yeah, interestingly, there were no trophies, medals or money or prizes at stake, but it definitely felt quite serious out there. It looks it looks serious from the side. And I think one, the, once the boat set off, so there was two different groups of um, colleagues in the boats. Primarily, you had a coach's boat and you had a mentor's boat. The mentor's boat, just it was almost like watching Oxford, Cambridge. They were just off. And it was almost like there was a a pause on the coach's boat and it sort of drifted into the middle of water. But it, once it got, everyone was, you know, the chest the chest hips started getting shouted and it gathered momentum. Um, it was quite interesting watching watching that. And I think it was, obviously, the trick was in the turn. So the, the, the mentor's boat had quite a good rhythm going. There was a couple of people who were stronger than others, but they flew past the bridge. They, they were that quick. I think the coach's boat, with a little bit of advice from the side, executed the turn early. Yeah, I think, helped. yeah. And the experts on the boat, in terms of from a coaching point of view, probably identified a couple of people who could really, maybe from the technical work that had been done a little bit earlier, that could really sort of drive that bit. So um, they allocated, well, not allocated, they, they assigned roles probably when we got to the bridge around actually numbers two and four, for example, you need to push the other way and it'll spin as quickly. Um but I, I don't know without speaking to him, but I think that was sp- specifically picked. I think the people on the boat that they identified were actually done for a reason in terms of observations from earlier on, in terms of trying to get to the tennis ball where we were asked to do certain skills um, and people felt more comfortable doing that or had a, a higher skill set in that area. Um, them allocation of roles then really helped in terms of us spinning that boat, especially the first one. Um, we turned we turned pretty quick on that first, first visit down to the bridge, which then gave everyone else a bit of a rest for a couple of seconds um, to then head back. Yeah, I think it, it was key there around, you know, the tactic, tactics of it. We as the players came up with them r- rather than the coach at the back shouting orders to us. We got down to the bottom, we kind of allocated the roles to each other and then we went back up ourselves. Um, I thought that was key instead of, you know, what we see a lot of is coaches telling players what to do. It was like... That's the game to get down there and back. You go and work it out. Yeah, what I found interesting was, <clears throat> Mark. Yeah, I think you uh, you didn't quite do that start justice. So, the the mentors boat that we that our boat were competing against, they they did take off rightly, but we almost ended up on dry land at one point. I would say it was the equivalent of being three 0 down at half time in a football match. What was interesting was that. You as the coach, Vicky as your support coach, if you like, are two experts in the boat. Nobody panicked. I didn't get the sense that we were going to get told off. We, uh, it was almost like, right, we're, we're in a bit of trouble here, but we can get out of it. All we've got to do is make, let's make the next action a positive one. Let's just get back in credit, so to speak. And all it was was, everybody stop. Let's just make one stroke that gets us on our way. And once we've done that, we can start to gather some momentum. And I thought that was really impressive leadership from from yourself and the coaches just to try and take stock of the chaos, uh, not panic, not shout. Let's just get one positive action and work off that. Was that predetermined or? I, I don't think it was predetermined. I think it was... Um... I mean, obviously, the, the coaches themselves were were briefed not to not to sort of get involved as such. But from my perspective, I saw it and I thought, well, my immediate thought was, I can't really affect anything here because it's it's a it's a technical thing that these guys are just picking up. They're just playing with it. It's new. I could shout something to you, but it would probably have absolutely no effect whatsoever. So I think, like you say, I think there was a 
there was a definite lull and a pause, but actually once it got going, it, it was fine. I think, again, if you watch the footage, because obviously there's, there's, there's quite a lot of footage out there. Um, I'm not sure if the BBC are going to show it. But, um, <clears throat> I think what you'll find on the footage is once you did get going, um, all you'll hear is, a, is quite a loud question from me saying, who's steering this boat, Jack? <laughs> Which, again, was... I didn't want to... I, I suppose I didn't want to sort of jack steer that boat. I, th- I suppose I wanted to put it into some sort of question to to really sort of hopefully make you think. But I think you were still playing with which... which if I pull it this way, which does it go? And if I pull it the other way, which does it go? But actually, again, once you nailed that and they, the technique of the people in the boat was, right, you, we've got this. Um, the actual execution of that turn, I agree with Andy, and actually he should take a lot of credit for that, that rowing work in that, in that particular thing. But the steering was really important at that point as well. So... I think that you actually realising, right, okay, actually, if I pull this and push that, that really helped execute that turn. I think um, that that is what built the confidence up because I think once you were going back down the way, the other team, despite how good they were doing in terms of their technique, they'd gone so far behind and because they their turn was probably only sort of similar to the QE2, um, was never, they were never going to catch back up. So I think that just gathered momentum then coming back down the river and the, the, the actual technique of rowing was getting better and better and better. But it was the confidence of actually doing something well in terms of that turn and you all recognising it. I think that galvanised that team. And there's a, there's a tendency within coaching when that first bit happens to jump in? And try and correct, and and I think not that not happening, but there was a couple of prompts, just helped us as a team. So sort of go actually, we we can do it, sort of thing. We will get there. It's not a problem. I think we have a tendency sometimes as coaches to, when it first doesn't happen, we then dive in and go actually, it's all wrong, or the the practice is wrong, or or the technical details wrong. Instead of actually just thinking actually, we're still learning of how to do it. Um, and even more so in a pressurised environment of it's a race and it became competitive between the two teams, that probably had an impact on the start of us all going, are oh, we all sort of tensed up and we're right, we've got to get there quicker than they have. That's 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 the, the race. Um, so that pressurised environment probably had an impact. But then allowing us to then try and self-correct had an impact not only on that race, but then subsequent the subsequent race that followed as well, I think from from our from our my point of view and in that team yeah. had a, had a massive impact. I, I think that that was probably a very a visible example of you know those players step over the line. Actually, the coach, you you can say as much as you want, but actually in that moment, the ownership has got to transfer to them players. They've got to sort that problem out themselves, and and that's that's exactly what happened. And realistically, nothing would have gone in. So if I if I wasn't worried about a boat coming at me. I wouldn't have been able to take on any more. I wouldn't have been able to take on information anyway. It, the boat, and one of them was a fair sized boat, by the way, that came at us. Um, if I wasn't taking any info in about that and I was potentially crashing to it, into it, I wasn't in a state to take on other information. I had probably the information I felt I needed. It was just about us working as a, as a team to try and figure out the best way of then putting that into action to, to propel us further down the water and catch the other team. Who, by the way, had veered massively left by this time as well. So that gives us a, probably a bit of a, a bit of a chance as well. Yeah, I think it's key how we, um, at the start, we just literally went for it, and all the all the practice we've been doing went out the window. And then it kind of that moment where Mark said, "Let's let's get that one bit right." It kind of brought us back to what have we been practicing for the last hour and a half? And when we got that first stroke right, we we kind of started to revert back to actually what have we been doing all the technical stuff that we we have been trying to do we started to you know revert back to that instead of it's a game we've got to go and win at all costs it was kind of like we, we didn't do that and then we went back the other way and then we got success so going back to you know we, we practiced for the game you know we've got to kind of do what we do in practice and demonstrate and then the game I thought we did that well in the winning team yeah that's uh, just reinforces that sticking to the plan yeah. and trying to practice for match day like you said Lawrence it was immediate as soon as the um, the the whistle to start the game went our plan was completely forgotten about because we were just too excited I suppose the importance for coaches listening is remembering what you've done remember it in, in practice training for the match and um, and sticking to sticking to the plan when things aren't going to plan yeah, yeah and I, I think the um, 
the interesting thing was obviously when it, when the race, the first race finished and the um, obviously the other boat put a bit of pressure on the coach or we won another race. And initially, because they recognised that actually the turn had won you guys the race, they said that, well, we just raced to the bridge. And I think the reason that obviously they wanted to do that is because they felt they, they got off the blocks really, really well. They had a good flow in terms of a straight line, but recognised they couldn't turn. So I, I just did a little bit of... Um, I don't know whether it's sort of dark arts or practice, but I, I got in amongst the coaches and just said, well, you know, I'm going to be, you know, if the race is from the steps to a turn back to the steps, then perhaps we should we should stay at that. And initially they weren't going to be swayed, but I just kept chipping away. And I think in the end they said, oh, yeah, well, we'll do it. We'll, we'll do it from the steps to the bridge back to the steps. Now, I'm not saying that's, that's really good coach behaviour on my part, but I suppose I wanted to try and keep the the game as it should be, as opposed to them sort of cutting it short in terms of just getting the other team success. However, on a, you know, being objective about it, there are times where actually you might want to manipulate a practice or manipulate a situation so those people that are struggling do get some sort of success and the benefits of that. So it's, it, it, there's an element of trade-off, but, um, but obviously once the competitive edge sort of kicked in and the fact that the other team recognised, yeah, we can we can beat them in a straight line, but you throw a turn in there, that's going to cause us a problem. And but that but that was perhaps yeah that that was reproduced second time around, mm. um, and it was the the, the the trick was actually in the turn as opposed to the uh, the straight line speed. Yeah. So it's it's having that technical ability to deal with all components of the game as opposed to just one component, but it takes a while to learn. I want to start to draw this to a close. One of the things I found really interesting was so. We won that race, 2-0. We take the boats out of the water, we get them back, then we go back over to the building and our head coach, Vicky, gave us a debrief through a, a question and answer session with one of our tutors. I want to start to unpick some of the things that, that Vicky said in her reflections of the morning that I found really interesting. So one of the things that stuck in my mind was that she fundamentally changed the way that she coached that morning because she was asked to by by our tutors and tell us how she changed her coaching style and what she fed back the impact was on her well I think from from what I recall she initially said that um if, if she'd had a, a group of learners in, it would probably be more um, command coaching and very much dominated by the coach in the sense of of giving people the solutions and telling them how, exactly how to manipulate a boat and what to do. Um, so in, in her early sessions, I think she, she um, referenced that it would probably be very much coach dominated in its early parts, maybe for the first two or three sessions that she worked with them. And because she was asked to adopt a different approach, it's not something she would normally do with a group of novices. But what she learned from the experience was the fact that actually, do you know what? She's probably going to coach the way that she was asked to in the future purely because um, as a group, I think you, you far exceeded her expectations. And that was perhaps because of giving you the problems to solve and perhaps not giving you any or too many solutions to those problems and allowing you to work that out. So that definitely that transformational uh, autonomy supportive stance that she took, I think, um, reaped a lot of benefits for her. And her, her personal reflection at that point was she's going to do that with novice groups in the future. Yeah, something that, something that stood out to me, I think she mentioned around by doing that, it would it saved her time. So by getting to week four, she'd probably done in, with us in one session what she would have done in four weeks with, a, with a, another group. And it, it, for me as a coach, that sort of stuck with me a little bit in terms of our players, when we're working with players, we have them once a week or twice a week, so we might have them for a couple of hours a week. How can we speed up the, the process of them learning and, and developing and understanding? Um, and from, from what you said, working in that way in terms of problem solving, not giving us the answers, letting us deal with some issues out there, um, but in a safe and trusted environment really helped in terms of the outcomes that she got from the session may have took longer doing it the way she originally did it or would have done it. Um, so for me as a coach, that sort of resonated quite quite a lot with me in terms of making sure we can we can make best use of the time we have with our players or participants, whatever it might be. I think it was key that um, she allowed us to make mistakes and through the problems that she set and the environment was always changing, like with the boats passing with, you know, the different way the tide was moving. It was more realistic. Um, I think she could have stood there and gone, this is how you do it. 
but then when we got on the water, it, it, it would have changed. So we're already in that environment where we could make those mistakes and we can start problem solving, which was really key. And then linking back to players, if you just stand there and tell them what to do, put them on the pitch and it's, again, it's the environment will change again. So I think that was key for our learning in terms of a group. It was key for us. Yeah, I think then she, she also linked that a step further to, I think, the coach ed programme and the coach education system that was in place within the sport potentially or historically have been in place of being quite a, a, te a tell sort of environment um, which again would link in terms of us in terms of new courses in terms of giving ownership over to coaches and, and wanting coaches to be individual and unique and, and um, that was quite interesting that she developed that way through the coach ed courses that she'd been on and because that's the way she'd been taught or delivered to she then replicated that when she worked with participants. Um, so again, had a real, real sort of clear link to sort of where we've shifted over the past sort of 18 months um, and how we can then help coaches put on, on sessions that will enable some of the stuff that we encountered as, as participants, um, which from both sides in terms of us as participants give real satisfaction in terms of being part of the activity. But also from a coach's point of view, there was a there was obviously quite a big shift in her thinking post post session as well. And and I think it links back to what you said earlier on, Andy, in the sense that um, there was there was a period of time in the when you were initially in the boat, almost looking at the, the coaches around, going, "Just tell me what to do." Whereas if you looked at the body language of once the boats were put away and the swagger back to uh, to the uni from the um, from from all the participants, there was a definite. Again, just looking at body language, there was, a, there was a definite change. So if you looked at the body language when you were first picked the boats up and put them at the first drop-off point, it, it was quite. It was pretty quiet. There was there was a little bit of sort of um, joking, but you, again, looking at body language, it was almost like well, I'm not sure what this is going to be like. But by the end of the two hours, there was there was a definite there was a definite um, confidence in people in the sense that they might not have mastered this thing. But it was far less. It was far less um, frightening if they'd had to go back and do it again. Yeah, and linking to like when you're working with your players and you want them to come back next week, being enthused and, and wanting to be there, and actually running across the pitch to you, sort of ten minutes before the session starts. And I get I get the feeling as a group, if they'd have said, actually, we're going to go back on the water this afternoon, to, to well, all of us would have probably gone, absolutely, let's get back on there. Um, because we felt quite positive about it. We individually probably self-assessed that we'd improved in terms of we'd got better during the session, technically. Um, actually, it was a, it was fun to be involved in. So it left us with that feeling of actually, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind doing some more of that, actually. It, it was quite it was quite a, a real positive feeling we left with, which when we're, again, when we're working with players, that's, the, that's, that's what we're after. We're wanting, we're wanting kids to come back the week after even more in love with the game. And, and wanting to be part of our sessions. So. Yeah, so I think what, what she did really, really well was that she mixed her coaching styles up, so it wasn't just one way. Um, once we got that confidence, she built that confidence within the team. Um, she then gave us freedom to go and, you know, work things out, make mistakes, and then when needed, you know, we'd have Mark who'd come and give us a bit more information. So I think by mixing up your, your, your teaching or coaching styles, with the players, I think that's that's really essential in terms of, you know, reining them in when you need to and show them sometimes, but then at the same time, let them go and express themselves. Yeah, I have to say that I was shocked when Vicky fed back to us the impact that it had, the morning it had on her and the extent to which she felt we'd improved compared with most groups that she coaches. That really, um, really reinforced some of the messages that you guys have, have just come up with there. It, for me, when you guys fed back to me, so although I said I had I had no idea what I was doing, by the time we en entered the race, I just decided, I, Lawrence, you were sat in, in seat number one, I think, or was it eight? Whichever one is, is directly in front of the cocks anyway. <laughs> it shows how much I, <laughs> I took. I just decided to try and make you feel good. So I, I think, Lawrence, all I was doing was uh, praising you for your efforts. And, and Andy, you were sat in the seat behind Lawrence and I just thought, well, I might as well just give make Andy try and feel good about his performance. And I didn't realise until we actually got in and we started to debrief everything, 
the impact that that had. I was, to be honest, I was, I was just encouraged from the sideline really to try and um, try and have a positive effect on the boat. Yeah, I think, and we've had, I've had a conversation today, literally about it as well, around the difference between um, encouragement and making decisions for people. There's a, there's a difference, and when we were on the second turn at the bridge and. I was a little bit responsible for the turn and I couldn't move the boat anymore. My arms had gone, my body had gone and I was finished. To hear that sort of keep going, you're fine. And actually at the time, the other boat had gone past us and I was feeling a bit like, oh, I've let everyone down here. So that positive reinforcement from, from you, Jack, to be fair, was sort of spared me on to go, do you know what? I need, even if I lift the oar more out of the water and only get a slightly turn and it's better than nothing. So that positive reinforcement sort of really spared you spared you on past past that sort of bit of technique technical stuff technical stuff had gone out the window a little bit because my body had sort of given up but that encouragement sort of just drove you on a little bit to mm. to make sure actually yeah we can come on keep going and also the little bit before that you did give some advice because you may may not think you did but when Loz was working and we were obviously had oars on the opposite side of the boat and and the information was just follow Loz's rhythm which no one had said before um, but allowed me to then go, actually, why have I not done that from the start? When Loz puts his oar in the water, well, I'll, I'll, that's the time I need to put mine in the water. And I sort of fed that back to someone behind me. So whether that then went down the boat and had a ripple effect, I'm not sure. But in terms of performance, had a massive impact. Yeah, so I guess from a, a coaching perspective is sometimes the, the players, even though they may be novices, they might look at things in a slightly different way. And, and they actually might surprise you with some of the ideas that they come up with, given the opportunity to do so. Yeah, I think the the outcome for us was to win the race, but the way we worked as a unit, the three of us, was all I wanted to do was just to make sure I was working hard. And then I didn't even know the the boat was in front. I still I, I didn't know they were. I thought we were in front of them. But all I was focused on was making sure I was getting that technique right. And then I didn't know we overtook them until just now I think the other boat is actually still going to Bristol to be <laughs> fair but um, <laughs> but just going back to, to Vicky the coach I think that that sort of epiphany in, in terms of for her around actually sometimes you can give these things over to, to novices and they'll, they'll probably surprise you I think is a, is a message again for us as coaches yeah and it, one thing for, for me was, um, was interesting that probably Vicky may still not be aware of that sort of sprung to mind in the boat, especially during the two races, was also being aware of, of what other participants and athletes are asking of each other. So there was, Lars said before, there was a start of like sort of sub teams and mini teams being created in, in, in the boats. And the individuals behind me, I remember saying he, he was calling sort of a rhythm as we were going. And I remember te- he stopped all of a sudden. And I remember going, keep going why have you stopped and he went I can't I, I, it's, it's affecting me technically and it, it's knocking me out of sync as an individual so there's a, there's a, there was something in there as well around the coach I don't know how it's done but being aware of what other people are asking of other people within the team and how that then affected performance because it did because it took the individual behind me sort of two or three seconds to sort of reset real rethink of what they needed to do in terms of getting going again. So as well as information that come from the coach, there was also then oh, how do we how do we as coaches figure out what other players are asking of each other as well? Um, because everyone was trying to learn from each other. So we're putting more and more probably demands on each other within the boat of how are you doing that? Can you do this for me as well? Um, which then impacted on, on everything in terms of team dynamics, us as individuals taking stuff from sort of the technical bit maybe dri- dropped off a bit, but they became more of a leader within the group and an organizer. So that I don't know, I don't know where it fits, but that understanding of. But but I think I think that that ability to sort of play with different parts again was a was a journey people went on. So although you might concentrate on one little thing, and then there was more layers being added to it. And again, it's probably exampled in terms of although we, we, it was done as a bit of a joke, so giving you the tennis balls in, in, uh, as the cocks. So on that second race, once you did the turn, I shouted to you about deploy the missiles. You're you quite happy to turn around in the boat and and perhaps encourage the other team by sharing some tennis balls with them. I couldn't miss Graham um, Carrick's head. Uh, probably not. But then still actually still actually steer the boat at that point to get it back down to the, to the finish line. Mm-hmm. So that, that ability to sort of layer... 
a little bit more detail for some people they were able to do that more yeah i'll be honest the uh, the steering i'm still trying to figure out now it was definitely trial and error <laughs> but uh yeah we got there guys i, I want to bring this to some sort of conclusion uh with a with a summary so a lot of this has been around us playing a a new sport as novices and our our reflections and experiences of being involved with that and how the impact of coaching and leadership behaviours impacted on us. So if you to summarise for the listeners, if you had one tip or one piece of advice for the coaches listening in out there who perhaps working with novice players based on your experiences of the day. So Mark... I don't know if you want to kick us off. I would just say don't underestimate your learner. We perhaps look through a lens of the world that actually somebody's a novice at something, therefore they can't do something. But I think certainly what I've picked up from the day is, even though it might be a brand new experience for you, if I pose you the right problem and support you in the right way, then potentially the sky's your limit, as they say. You, you, could, you could just sort of demonstrate, allow you to demonstrate what you know um, and if you need support along the way, just provide it. But if you don't need it, then just let you self-discover. For, for, for me on that, it, it sort of links around, don't, afraid, don't be afraid for it to be messy and look unorganised. There was a couple of individuals who went past us very smoothly in a, in a, in a rowing boat and looked at us a bit like, what is going on over there? Um, but it, it wasn't seen as a, a reflection on the coaches. It was seen as these are learning how to row. So actually, that's fine that we went round in circles to start. That's not that's not an issue. Um, so don't be afraid for it to to be messy and look a bit unorganised to start. Because actually, the learning was was sped up as part of that. I think you know linking to both of those, um, you know, give specific feedback to your players, and then don't just progress them for the sake of it. On your session, it, on your session plan, it might say not to ten minutes. I've got to do this, and at fifteen, I've got to do this. But if they haven't reached that point yet don't just progress them for the sake of it so give specific feedback to suit the needs of your players yeah and just just the last one it sort of it's come out come up a couple of times just just around language would be another another just just to be aware of the language we use when we're working in terms of terms that are common within the game but actually what does that mean to a six or a seven year old and actually trying to us being novice performers sort of that it really really struck home with me in terms of the language that was used to us I, I didn't have a clue of any of the terms that were mentioned, but when then it was translated to something that actually we can get, it, again, it, it moved us on really quickly. Um, so the language was, was huge, especially when we're when working back in football with younger players. How how much of a, an impact does that language have on, on what you're trying to do with your players? I think one thing as well, as well I will point out is that... Um, Chris Morris had a very, very uh, pop, uh, really good career in terms of being a professional footballer and international footballer, but him swapping boats was probably the worst transfer he's ever had. <laughs> Brilliant, Mark. <laughs> I would. Uh, the, what I felt from um, observing from within the boat was, if you as a coach in your behaviours can show and demonstrate patience with your players you start to gain trust and it almost becomes a virtuous cycle. And I think there's probably a lot that we can learn and transfer into when we're working with our own players in a, in a football environment. Guys, this has been fantastic. It's a really enjoyable evening. We've spent far too long and it's way past dinner time now. So I'm not going to keep you for any longer. Really appreciate you taking your time out to, uh, to come and chat about your experiences. Uh, so Lawrence Locke, Mark Haining, Andy Summers, thanks once again and um, cheers. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please help spread the word or leave us a review on iTunes. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. You can reach me on Twitter at Jack Walton one And don't forget to follow Liverpool FA at Liverpool underscore CFA. See you next time.